That's it. We're on. Welcome oh. to Singavio's Google Hangout on the 23rd of November, which is, of course, Black Friday. And let's go through a couple of things, right? Uh, let's, Neil Singer, Dale Henry's here, Doug in Scotland, right. Graham, and our special guests today, Harry Hi. and Rosanna. Hi. Creation, which is an incredibly impressive organization, which we're going to come on to in a minute. Right, so remember, we're CPD accredited. Anybody who wants a CPD certificate, they've just got to send us an email afterwards and we'll have a question for them and they can start and then you can get a CPD certificate. Remember that we are on YouTube, so if you sign up to our YouTube channel, you will receive notifications of everything which we're selling and any news and any Google Hangouts. And of course, we will be, we have our podcast. So on your way home tonight, you can listen to the Singivale 23rd of November Google Hangout. Right. Before we, actually, let's just introduce you. Let's just, in before we go to our guests, we're, Dale wants to talk about something, don't you, Dale? Dale's going to jump straight in and he's going to talk about, what is it, Dale? Well, you've already mentioned it. Given the day it is today, I thought I would talk about and get people's views on Black Friday. Because um, I, for one, am very cynical about it and think it's all really a gimmick. Um, Black Friday, oh, can everyone hear me? Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. um, Black Friday started off as a one-off one day of discounts and deals, and it seems to have just gone from that to this never-ending uh, run of, of, of offers from all these retailers. In fact, Amazon... Uh, said that this year is their longest ever uh, Black Friday, which actually lasts for 10 days. Um, but what's interesting and a little bit worrying about is that Black Friday spending, is ex from, from, from what I've read, is expected to dip for the first time ever since it came to the UK. To the UK. And according to research, consumers will spend £2.4 billion pounds on deals in stores and online, which is down from last year's £2.6 billion. And footfall, they're expecting to be down 3.7% compared with last year. And online transactions will be down 5% on last year. So it seems like this sales event is predicted to do very little to, to help the high street. And for those of you who think who are out shopping today and thinking you're getting a great deal, um, the watchdog witch warned shoppers that last year, they found that for, from six months before Black Friday until six months afterwards, 87% of items were cheaper at other times of the year. So um, I think there's just a sheep mentality amongst retailers when it comes to Black Friday. Everyone else is doing it, so we have to. And, and they don't want to be shunned by the consumers. But I think it's often a lost leader for these retailers. And all it's doing is bringing the Christmas spending forward a bit. Um, and I, 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 I don't know what everyone else thinks, but I think this run up, the run up to this Christmas, I don't think has ever been so important for retailers' results and, and possibly their survival, given what's going on in the retail industry at the moment. Uh, it's in such a delicate state. So I think if, if retailers get this Black Friday wrong, who knows what we, I, th I think they're all on such a financial knife edge that this could um, sort of tip them over the edge if it goes sort of not according to plan. But um, that's my view anyway, so I don't know what everyone else thinks about it. Having said that, I did get £50 off my son's <laughs> PlayStation for his birthday. So, Are um, you sure you get £50 all up there, Dale? Yeah. And, and um, always good to hear positivity is what I say. Now, anyone <laughs> got any comments relating to what Dale said? Do you all believe that it's a load of nonsense? Should we start? In fact, should we start with the generation who probably shop more than we do? Harry, Rosanna, what do you think of Black Friday? <laughs> I think it's it's a good opportunity to try and get something for a lower price. But I personally, I, for me, because I'm having to look look after what I'm spending, I'll always have bought stuff before then. So I think it's it's a bit of a gimmick from shops just to try and get people to spend more. I think a lot of people by this point in the year will have already bought 
a lot of stuff that they need. Um, and it's sort of a try just try and encourage you to, yeah. Yeah, you're clearly not married, Harry. <laughs> Yeah. Rosanna, what, why aren't you guys out? Have you been out shopping? No, I'm actually, I'm not a big shopper um, <laughs> myself. Um, and Black Friday, just, I mean, it, it just kind of elevates impulse purchases more than anything, doesn't it? So those things, for me, like if I need something, I'll get it. On Black Friday, um, I found myself in the past where I did shop a little bit more, buying all the rubbish that I didn't actually need <laughs> just because it was so cheap. So, um, yeah, I'm not, I don't really get on board with it. Although I did get, some coupons through today for hair treatments that are on Black Friday, so I, maybe I'll look at them, but maybe not the actual shopping itself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There was a lot of buzz in the office today, especially at lunchtime, a lot of people going like, oh, I've seen this, this is this much off, I'm saving this much money. Um, but something my partner always says to me, he's like, no, you're not actually saving any money, you are spending money. So. Ah, yes, but you see, there's a mentality among certain people that if let, the mentality goes something like this, Harry, it's it's, well, it wasn't. It was on on offer. It was on on a hundred pound. But actually, I've only had to pay eighty. So I've actually, I've saved twenty. I've actually made. So I've actually got twenty pound more to spend elsewhere. So actually, it's. I've actually saved you money my shopping today. That is a. That's a common theme you hear as you get older. Anyway, the, the reality. The truth is, though, in 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 all seriousness, is uh, last year Black Friday was one day, wasn't it? This year is a whole week. It does show. I think the retailers are possibly struggling i know it's a bit of um jumping on top of each other but i think the poor retail industry given how hot the summer was um i think they're going to find it i do think they're having real trouble and i am a bit worried like dad about what's going to happen at christmas so buy your shops now what's happening in scotland graham have you been well I, I i think they're right about black friday from the point of view is a bit of a lost leader but my understanding is it's also a bit like that harry said that you go on there to buy one thing and you end up buying five or six other things fortunately i didn't get the vouchers through for hair treatment so it's not going to make any difference to me but uh, <laughs> well, i do I'll think back, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe, maybe i do need I'll, the hair treatment i'll give you mine graham i got someone <laughs> oh they worked yeah i can see that yeah are you in the um, same office today no 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 that's why you can hear me oh okay 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 <laughs> Right, so I, uh, has anyone got any more views? If any, can I just say, anybody watching who wants to um, either join, actually, if you've got the balls to join as a participant right <clears> now, <throat> send an email to us, neil at singervl.co.uk, and we will send you a link straight away, and you can join the discussion right now, or you can send us a message on um, the YouTube channel. You'll see there's a place can you can make a, a comment. Now, given it's Black Friday, I'm going to play a game. This is all CPD accredited, remember? It's all very serious. Does anyone here, does anyone here remember a show called Call My Bluff? I have to say yes, unfortunately. Oh, so there's one. <laughs> yeah, call me, you, Doug, you remember Call My Bluff? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, remember it. Yeah. You got, I don't suppose you guys have heard of it, have you? Is it a generation thing, guys? Because I've never heard of it. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to... Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you four reasons, right, why Black Friday is called Black Friday. And you've gotta tell me, you've gotta tell me if you which is correct. I'm gonna we're gonna whether I'm telling the truth or whether it's a bluff. So there's four things. All right. Well, will there be one correct answer or can you be bluffing on all, all four of them? Well, we're gonna have to find out, aren't we? Okay. <laughs> we'll have to find out. Okay, so let's go through the first one, right? The first one is this. This is the first the first reason why Black Friday is called Black Friday. Okay. Right. And I've just I've had these I've just had these sent through on the um telex. Right, on the telex. Right. In 1869 in Ohio, USA, a farrier named Johann Sebastian, he had an idea to generate new business. And he occupied one of a row of stables, all in white, on a street known as Friday Bourbon. Okay, so he had the idea of painting his stable black in order to get more business. And indeed, this did the trick. And not only did the business stand out, which gained him curious customers, but attracted the attention of a local journalist called Dwight Woodcock of the Ohio Weekly. And he published an article on for on the Friday following Thanksgiving, and he called it Black on Friday. 
because you know it because it was a black stables and it was on and it was on friday boulevard and it attracted business so that's reason one reason one got that everyone yep right bear that in mind don't no answers yet no answers yet just right number two right here's the next one number two right the day after thanksgiving it became associated with a holiday where retailers would seek to boost sales given the extended holiday weekend and due to the mayhem this caused in 1961 the philadelphia police department coined the phrase black friday since the traffic chaos caused was so disruptive and plus it meant that the police had to work extended shifts to deal with the issue hence they, it was a black day for them so they called it black friday okay that's number two it's exciting isn't it number two right number three number three retailers started to open the day after thanksgiving to boost sales in fact some stores such as macy's and bills started in the 2000s opening at midnight of thanksgiving in order to create a frenzy um and due to the amount of business business generated on this friday it would often make the difference between a company being in profit or loss so it would often move it from being in the red to being in the black hence black friday that's three okay three and the last one the last one is there was this bloke called blake blake friday who was a charismatic shrimp fisherman who lived in alabama in the 1870s and he was not only popular with the locals because he was so charismatic but he was also quite popular with the young ladies and his wife rosie was becoming quite suspicious now on the day after thanksgiving he ventured into town to buy some bourbon because they drunk all the bourbon on thanksgiving and his wife rosie was quite suspicious by then so she followed him into town without him realizing and she spotted him in a department store meeting and kissing a young lady in the local department store so she was so angry that she picked up a shovel nearby and whacked him with it and such was the commotion that many passers-by all ventured into the store to see what was happening now this of course generated a big audience and on seeing blake who by then because he'd been whacked on the head by a shovel he had a black eye the crowd started to tease him and instead of calling him blake friday they started to tease him calling him black friday brilliant. and the store Absolutely which was brilliant. called johansson's in ohio they jumped on the idea and and because they made so much business on that day they started to call it black friday and that was the start of black friday okay so right we've got we've got four We've got for anybody watching can vote right <laughs> watching for somebody we've got right number one remember number one was there was it was due to it was due to john sebastian johann sebastian painting painting his stables black right or two it was the police in philadelphia who called it black friday because of the traffic and the congestion or three it was the retailers pushing profits from lost to profits making red to black or four, it was Blake Friday. Right. Let's go. Let's start with the. Let's start with Harry. Harry, what do you think? Which one? Um, three. So you're going for the profit to the loss to profit. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm Harry. Right. Okay. Okay. Johanna. Rosanna. Though I really want it to be one or four, <laughs> I am going to go with number two. So you're going with uh, the Philadelphia Police Department, aren't you, Graham? Yeah, I love I love number four, but there's number two. So you're going with the okay. So you're also going with the Philadelphia Police Department, okay, Graham? Doug, I'm going to go with number three. Doug's going with oh, this is a two-way tie. Doug's going with retailers going from red to black dale okay i know for a fact that two and three are correct so i'm actually going as much as i think number four is the most ridiculous far-fetched story i'm going for all four i'm going for all four oh hold on i've got a bit of feedback advantage by the way <laughs> you're going for all four yeah 
Ah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Okay. Okay. So we've got. Okay. Right. Nobody knows that Dale's sitting across from you. No, no. Dale didn't. He, he did. Can I just tell you, Dale, he didn't even know this was coming. I actually didn't. Okay. Right. Dale. Right. Here we go. Number one. This is very exciting, isn't it? Right. Ohio Sebastian. Johann Sebastian, who painted his shed black. Ready? Right. This is what they, this is what they, this is what they used to do in Call My Bluff. All right. Ready? Is it true or is it a bluff? Excellent. So Dale, you're you're Dale, you're down. Next one. Philadelphia Police Department. Ready? Very exciting, isn't it? Yay! <laughs> Right, next one. The retailers are uh, staving off going bust. Dale, what did you say? You thought this was true, did you? Yeah. yeah. Hey. <laughs> and the last one was about Blake Friday, the fisherman. Thank you, <laughs> I, I think you'll all be shocked. But that was my favorite. Right. Okay. So that's down. To, right. So that's a bit of um, education. So in fact, Dale is almost right because it was, there's actually two reasons. There's, there's actually, it's not actually quite clear why Black Friday is called Black Friday. So there's actually two reasons to it. It does seem as if it's number one, the Philadelphia police. And number two, it was because retailers trying to stave off going bust. Right. Let's jump in and talk about creation. Let's talk about creation. It's such an impressive business. Who wants to go first? Harry, Rosanna? Who wants to tell us about, how did you come up with the idea of creation? And what, and what is it? So creation is an organization myself and Rosanna set up. And essentially we run events on hot topics in the real estate industry for free for people just starting out in their careers in property. I'll, I'll let Rosanna tell you about why we set it up. Okay. Come on then. So really it was um, just for the lack of opportunity that there was in the industry. So we were constantly being told that the connections you make at the start of your career will last you throughout and all these kind of important important things, but we never really had a place to go and connect connect with these people that was, they're all like kind of high cost or um, kind of inaccessible. So Harry and I kind of sat down and we were like, first we approached a couple of um, organizations and they, essentially they were, they were just different we just didn't kind of see the chemistry there so we we're like why don't we just go and set up our own one um thinking we might just do one event and then it was one event every quarter and now here we are doing one event every month in london <laughs> so it's growing quite substantially yeah it's, it's i think it's i mean i i for those watching I, I did attend one of the events and it really is an impressive thing you guys have done i mean it's changed different we were young when we were young we used to people like doug and uh, Graham and myself, we used to meet people uh, down the pub or coffee. And uh, I think today it has changed enormously. I mean, what you've got is a fan you've created a great thing. When I when I came to your event, I thought the atmosphere was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. So I think what you guys have done is really tremendous. So can I just can I just ask you to tell people watching if they want to join in, if they want to join your club, what do they have to do? Who's going? Who's, so we, who's talking? We've got a website which is www.cree, so C R E hyphen Asian. There it is. Dot com. Okay, there it is. <laughs> and you can sign up on the website. And if you sign up to the mailing list, you'll get emails about all of our upcoming events. Um, we also have social media accounts. We have a LinkedIn page. Um, we've got Instagram, Twitter. And you can follow us on there and we'll always post about all of our upcoming events on our social media platforms as well. So that one, the, the event we held yesterday was on flexible offices posted by British Land. Um, and then we're running through, we do an inspiring individuals page where you can hear from, okay, I that. And, um, you can hear from people across the industry. I've just been on, I clearly just been on holiday. <laughs> <laughs> um, Okay, can I ask if can I ask you guys some questions? Um, 
it's interesting what you said about your frustration in, with the industry. I'd like to ask you, as relative, can I call you relatively new surveyors? Is that is that okay to say that? You can go with that. Relatively <laughs> new surveyors. What's your experience of the industry? Is it? Do you find our industry forward thinking, or are we a bit behind the curve, or or are we are we dynamic? Or I'm just interested from a younger person's perspective. I've got certain views of our industry. I'm interested to hear what you guys think. Um, I guess the industry itself is dynamic as in real estate is ever changing in the way people work with real estate but i think the response to how dynamic the industry can be is quite slow um so we're quite slow to get on kind of into into the technology and start integrating that into our business even though the actual property itself and the actual things that affect property so politics blah blah, blah all of that is dynamic i think the actual way that we go around doing the business isn't as dynamic as the actual industry itself, if that makes sense. Yeah, completely. I think, I think from, from my point of view, um, the industry itself can seem quite impenetrable from the outside. So it, it's an industry where a lot of people already know each other, it's quite small. But if you're new to the in industry and you're coming in and you don't know anyone, it can, it can be quite daunting um, and quite hard to sort of feel or enter enter the industry and that's again why we set up creation because neither of us have family in the industry and we just wanted a place where people can start to build those connections interesting yeah okay i i i'm mean, doug um graham I'll jump in whenever you want can i i'd like to ask you guys something else so i as you know i'm pretty technology focused as a in terms of our business what's your experience of your company and also other companies embracing technology? I don't think they're embracing it fast enough. Um, so to me, technology is really important, um, but I don't think that, I think real estate is can be quite old fashioned in the way that we think about technology, um, especially things like prop tech, both in solutions to clients, but also our own technological infrastructure. Um, my company's starting to get much better at it now, but it can take a while for there to be technology solutions. Anything to add? Um, I agree with Harry, but I think there's a huge opportunity here for um, the younger generation to almost mentor and have a effect and a stamp in their, in their own company. So historically, I guess when technology wasn't so huge, um, it, it naturally the mentorship came from um, the seniors in the teams but I think there's a lot that junior level staff can bring in way of technology and their understanding and how to implement and work with it which is quite an interesting way to start um, integrating it into companies which I think is a really exciting opportunity for individuals entering the industry. Have you come across situations where you've proposed things to um, clients or uh, um, more senior people in your organisations and you just hit a brick wall? No, actually I did a pitch um, and I was I was pitching to quite a, a, it's a global um, tech based company and um, I just kind of said to them, I was like, the best way to do this is to create a video and we're not going to do a document, we've got to do a video and we've got to make it, we've got to kind of mirror their beliefs and how they work through the way that we pitched them. And it was really well received and we actually went forward and did the pitch in a video format. Um, whereas previously, I think our company would have been more document based, which was quite exciting. The truth is people are bored of PowerPoint presentations. <laughs> I agree with you completely. And I think from my perspective, what's, what I see a lot of is a willingness from the senior people in my organisation to learn from the younger generation or if, if we have better knowledge about something technology focused so like blockchain they will happily let some like me or someone else speak about that but i think in the wider industry often at some of some events um you can have people talking about technology solutions who um don't dig into the detail because maybe they only have the the few high level bullet points and so what was really nice when we did our blockchain um talk and we had you neil speaking 
is that you were able to give more insight because you have a good understanding of PropTech and those um, technology, whereas sometimes you get big names talking about stuff because they're a big name and they're a good draw, but maybe they don't know the nitty gritty about that solution or that technology. You're implying that I'm not a big name. Is that is that? <laughs> no, I'm trying to compliment you, saying you have good knowledge on stuff. <laughs> not 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 everyone who speaks. Yeah. All right. Okay. We'll let we'll let you we'll let you off there. We'll let you off there. Okay. So the next, I I it's interesting actually because I do you think that um again, I think that agency's changing. Do you think that have you seen agency change since you've been working at Cushman's? I I'm a great believer that the agents don't realize what's coming around the corner and it's coming around the corner very quickly. So, which is why we try and focus on tech as our, in our business. Have you mm -hmm. seen, uh, do you think agents are, are, are beginning to wake up or are they still trying to continue in their traditional fashion? I think agents are becoming more adaptive to change and they are starting to see the impact that te technology um, or technological advancements will have on agency. But do you know what I think, Neil? I mean, the, the agency has to waken up, but it's it's very slow as an industry. And I think even the, the girls touched on this at the beginning, as an industry, we're still behind the curve in terms of uh, embracing technology and everything else. And I mean, to be honest, Neil, long may that continue from our point of view, because we at Singer Bell have embraced technology and uh, I, I think you know the, the 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 younger surveyors of today technology is what they know it's it's what they they want to use but I, I, I see certainly the firms and agency and and property generally is pretty slow to embrace that um, which as I say is good for us. And I think with technology advancement so fast you need to continually be adapting and evolving you can't sort of say all oh, right we'll take this on board and we'll incorporate this one thing and then it takes a year to do to implement that change and then you think okay well I'm, i've done that now you you need to constantly be innovating and i think that's what's quite difficult especially about our industry the the pace of change has been relatively slow um and yeah if, if you look at the technological advancements in the past sort of two years it's more than in the past 10 before that, so. You know, let me tell you something you might find interesting. I went to a conference last week and um, one of the guys speaking was from a an organization called Concrete, which is a venture capitalist um, firm for prop tech. And I can't remember who they told me, but a fund in America, I'm sure the numbers were this, a fund in America had raised $100 billion to go into technology and 27 billion was going into prop tech i'm sure that was the right i'm sure that number was correct there's a i mean america's leading the charge with all this but there's a huge amount of money going to the technology space mm -hmm. and but there's a lot of hype as well and a lot of the though i always say there's two things i say and i'm interested in your feedback um given that you're where you are in the industry is first of all a lot of people are trying to come up with solutions for problems which don't exist, and hence these prop tech firms won't be around. And the and the um, and the second thing is that I find that a lot of senior people are trying to don't understand the technology mm -hmm. side, so they're trying to teach younger people how to operate the way they operated 25 years ago. But the world has changed, and they try and it's hard for them to teach. A 25 year old as a 50 year old how to operate in today's environment and i bet that causes some frustrations what do you think no yes dale you're young <laughs> am i <laughs> i was actually going to say for for i don't consider myself young for the younger generation it, it, it sounds like it it must be a very frust very frustrating if you're working in these businesses where you know, you're growing up in a in a generation which embraces technology, yet you're in firms and industry as a whole which which generally doesn't. I just would have. It must be if, if I was if it was me coming through now. It, it, yeah, I, I, it must be very frustrating at times if you're um, if 
you if you're if you're faced with that i would have thought i mean it's frustrating but like we mentioned earlier it does offer a unique opportunity should your company be open to it for you to really let yourself shine and make a mark so when i actually because i was at cushman's before i came to my company now when i left my team i was like this is what i've noticed and this is how i think you can do this and this and this and i actually fed back on what I think they can be using and what solutions they could be using to increase their efficiency based on the things that I know that perhaps they may not know. And it does, if you are if you have that mind and that want to really elevate yourself and to be an innovator and to want to change the industry and your company are becoming more open, which more and more are, it's not like everyone's closed books, they're not, they're not talking about it. They, they realize that like, you have to embrace this and you have to do it quickly that you you are in a unique position if you are of that personality who wants to be able to do that. Mm. I think it does. I think it's got huge opportunities for everybody, actually. And I think as you, the, the, I agree with you. The trick is, is to embrace it and not be scared of it. So the last thing I wanted to ask you, and I have to ask, I'm really sorry. I have to ask you, <clears throat> amongst you and your peers, What's your view on Brexit and uh, the property game? Who wants to go first? Me, I'm working. I'm, I'm residential London development, so I'm <laughs> I'm sat every single day pulling my hair out. One minute I'm excited that I found a development, and the next minute I'm too scared to put an offer in because God knows what's going to happen to the prices. And I, I have to say, it's in the office. It is. I mean, we, we, we're working on developments now and I'm looking at it, I'm like, okay, this area has been increasing by 8% over the last, every year for the last few years. I can't guarantee that now. And I'm like, well, what if it decreases 15% when this happens at Brexit? And you, you it's just an absolute minefield. And um, it's making my job extremely difficult. My day to day, trying to convince myself that I'm comfortable with what I'm doing and other people. And it just means that I'm not we're not buying anything we're not we're not actively doing anything because we're just in terms of my area of the business the rest of the business are a little bit more active but they're more um international but in terms of london i'm i'm too almost being very tentative because i just uh, it, I, it's my field <laughs> basically are you contemporary of a similar i mean i mean you hear that the younger generation, what was it, seventy percent voted to remain? Are they? Fr are, are your contemporaries generally frustrated, or scared, or worried? I mean, I think there's definitely frustration. Um, just generally, everyone I know who's my age wants to remain and wants Brexit to be sort of called off or wants another referendum. Um, on the result and so a lot of people feel unheard or like their views you just feel a bit at odds to the wider population I think that all oh, that's what I'm feeling from from my friends um yeah it's a very, it's a it's it's a very difficult time I have to say um, I've had a couple of people mention the security of their jobs as well to me as a young surveyor coming into an industry that's being impacted. Some people are like, I don't know, not not security in that they're going to get fired. But obviously, they've got all this stuff going on with retail, commercial, which is obviously a huge part of the industry. Then suddenly Brexit on top and everyone's like, "Where? How, what is my pathway going to be in X amount of years if all of this is changing so much? And, and I think people are just a little bit worried about what the future holds in terms of themselves as well and their security in their own jobs. Yeah, well, let me give you some comfort. You're not alone, all right? You're not alone. <laughs> it's, you it's, know, it's, Brexit is certainly <clears throat> significantly more important than the Scottish independence referendum. There's no doubt about it. It's massive. But we we experienced this a few, uh, two or three years ago when we had the referendum. And to me, there's a lot of similarities. A lot of people are quite obviously sitting in their hands. They're waiting to see what happens. Um, and, and that's understandable. But at the same time, certainly we experienced during the run-up to the referendum, other people saw it as a time of opportunity to come into Scotland and do deals and uh, buy properties when they felt the competition was was uh, less and, and maybe they would get a deal. Um, and at the end of the day, the world isn't going to stop. I mean, Brexit is going to happen. I'm telling you that right now. You heard it from me first, but uh, <laughs> it's going to happen. Um, and, and it will happen 
hopefully in the time scale that that's being uh, it's being talked about and unfortunately it's just another um thing in the cycle of property that uh that impacts us now and again but um there's no doubt it's making things very challenging well see i would say that we're in a very strange i mean i've been in the market a few years and it's a very strange market because we are in a, a down cycle before even brexit before even brexit's brexit has of course caused everything to slow down but you've got retailer being retail being affected by online you've got brexit and you've got a natural cycle coming to an end so it's very hard to know now i think the industry as a whole thinks that this is just a cycle and it's just going to we're going to just come out i think there's a fundamental shift in our whole industry as a result of i think it's technology i think it's changing everything brexit is wearing and is affecting people's optimism and their ability their, their probably their desire to invest funny thing is when things are are down what do you do do you invest for the upside or do you button down the hatches or do you start using invest technology that someone else has already developed bye that might, bye bye it might help you i can't think of anything myself i don't know if anyone's got any ideas but um well, I think for one, I work in um, global occupier services for Fisherman Wakefield, and I'm in, in the strategic consulting team. So Brexit's actually brought an, an interesting layer to some of the work I do, because we're advising occupiers on their real estate strategy. And a lot of the time we're asked, is it going to, should we be locating here? What about Brexit? Does that mean that we should actually not be in this? Because we're also an international team. So should we not be in in the UK should we move somewhere else um so I guess it doesn't really answer the should we invest or not question but for occupiers it is a lot it is stuff that's on their mind and it does play into some of the, the wider work that we're doing interesting the opportunity thing if it was just a down cycle in the in the market I'd be I would, I would want to buy constantly because where there's a down cycle there's an up cycle it's it's the sheer it's just unknowing how much of an effect this Brexit thing is going to have in March. That is the thing that's preventing me to want to invest. It's not the down cycle, because like you say, you get down cycles and there's huge opportunity there to be able to purchase and then to be able to reap the rewards on the up cycle. But it's the unknowing of how much damage Brexit is going to cause that's preventing us to want to invest too heavily at the moment. You know, a, a friend of mine, a, a very shrewd friend of mine said something which I think is absolutely the case he said it's ne it won't be as bad as you think and it won't be as good as you think when we come out the other side and that's we'll get through it we'll get through it we'll be okay but it's just a bit of a pain i mean it really is it's so unnecessary i mean you know i'm not going to name any names but we all know certain people in the property industry who are big fans of brexit and i think they are nuts I think it's interesting that, um, that business are starting to get behind it a bit more positively. I don't know if anyone saw Question Time last night, but they had a former chairman of John Lewis and the current um, managing director of Iceland both on the panel, and they were both as positive about just let's get this done, just do it. I mean, it might not be the best deal that's in front of us, and really trying to get the message to the politicians that the pe business people out there just want this certainty to come. And I'd never heard these two clearly well well well-spoken but highly high, highly influential retailers talk so positively and, and i got a wee bit of a buzz from that in all the negativity negativity and uh, but uh, the, the real worry i think that many have is 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 the politicians and will this will this deal get through and there still seems to be huge uncertainty relating to that but one hopes that, that the next week to fortnight um we might see a bit more solid positive thought on that and that might just that might just be the next stepping stone that might uh, might help move us forward I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what, hands up, who thinks the Brexit deal is going to get through? Oh, three? Three, really? <laughs> okay, hands up, who thinks Theresa May is going to be our Prime Minister in a month's time? Oh, there you are. So that, there you are, interesting. Okay, I actually think, I think it will get through Parliament, actually. I, I and um, I think I'll get through Parliament, and I, I hope that will suddenly give a positive sign to the whole industry and business yeah. because we all know we all know where we're going. In fact, I'd be really surprised if it doesn't get through Parliament. I'm well, the... oh, go on, sorry. Well, I just think it's very easy. It's very easy to knock something, isn't it? 
it's very it's very say oh it's terrible, it's terrible but what but no one comes up with the alternative and and I, that's what i find that, um well there is one alternative of course there's there's of course people are hoping that mr corbyn comes in and can i just tell you uh, harry if uh, mr corbyn does come in you you won't be you will be relocating to paris so you know so pack your bags but i don't think that's going to happen either actually anyway so it's all positive i would say there is a change i i would say come after christmas i think we'll be okay i think we'll get i do think it'll get through parliament and i think everyone will go right we know what we're dealing with let's get on with it i hope so anyway can I ask the girls, because I'll be, uh, all my younger surveying colleagues will ask, obviously we're based in Scotland, is there plans to roll out uh, the model throughout the UK? So we've already got a branch in Manchester, They that launched in March this year, and there's plans to open up more regional offices, so Birmingham and Bristol, and Scotland is on the cards, but we have to measure how we... Um, open there we have to have a good strong committee so if there are companies in scotland who want to get involved and they've got um, other graduates or apprentices who want to get involved then get in contact with us and we're happy to chat yeah put, if anybody wants to meet harry or rosanna again and you haven't got a direct link just give us a call send me an email i'll put you in direct touch would be delighted would be delighted okay that's i think that's been really interesting is there anything you want to ask us any any ideas? I mean, any any com any positive comments for the existing industry as new people in with energy? I love your energy. <laughs> that's, what we, that's what we need more of. Um, I'll let you go. You can think about it. Harry no? has Harry has no idea. <laughs> Let's should we, should we talk deals for one minute? Let's talk deals, okay? Because that's what that's why we're all here. Actually, you know, Graham, you had something to say, didn't you? Let's talk deals another time. Graham, what did you want to say? Well, I was just going to talk about lawyers for five minutes and <laughs> see how yeah. that goes down. Notice the laughter. Yeah, yeah. Go, yeah. yeah. Well, I just thought I'd throw it in there. Actually, we've had an interesting week. Um, as you will hear shortly, we've we've completed another couple of sales this week. And um, what's what's been really interesting is that uh, I mean, our, our model is set up that uh, the deals will happen quickly and they'll happen easily and we're able to facilitate all of that. But inevitably, a problem may arise. And um, what's happened in, in these two deals is that the, the lawyers and neither party was represented kept me in the loop throughout the deal and we all worked together to find a solution to the issues. And um, it, was, it was actually very... Um, rewarding and interesting to have that rather than having resistance and lack of communication and uh, i can't speak to you because i'm speaking to them it was it was very refreshing and um it was just something i wanted to throw in i mean don't get me wrong we all have our issues with lawyers but um i think it's just i want to throw that in there to the to the solicitors i mean the solicitors in both deals communicated with me i mean as one solicitor put it to me you know it's the buyer's lawyer to find issues um, and highlight them to the buyer. Um, but also, I, I believe that they, they should be trying to find solutions to these and to be open to solutions. And in this case, they were, and we all work together. So um, I do spend a lot of time tearing my hair out, as you can see, with lawyers. Uh, I think as do all agents, and um, sometimes they, they view us a bit as the enemy when actually we're all just wanting to work together. So, um, no, it was, it was a good experience with lawyers on... Uh, four different sets of lawyers on the two transactions and um it, it worked well so i just have wanted to lawyers, throw that in the lawyers um attitude change towards tech nope not at all not at all i mean they the certainly virtually all the lawyers we have gone to with the singerville singerville model have been very receptive very receptive to it and they see the benefits to them in terms of speeding up the conveyancing process and everything else i mean there's there's the odd bigger firms who think that they, that they know how to do it and this is the way we've always done it and we're not going to. And you and I have spoken about that, but uh, I, I don't think they've particularly embraced the, the tech side of things, but I could be wrong. I've got something interesting to show you. Um, this is, there you go. Let's have a look. Okay, so everyone, look, this this is the Law Society Gazette 
from January this year, where Michael Cross um, actually wrote an article about my favorite topic, blockchain. And it was it related to the first property transaction using the click to purchase system. It was the first transaction worldwide where blockchain was used as part of the sale process. And Michael Cross did an article about it in the Law Society Gazette. And my favorite comment, which I often quote, is the, is the following one, which was in the comment section. Here we go. This is, here we go. I don't know if you can all see that. Can you see that here? Blockchain is unadulterated nonsense designed by someone who either has no idea about property law or worse, who does have such knowledge, but whose clear intention is to develop a high tech way to make money easily out of the general public's ignorance of property law and computer technology. And um, it got 17 likes. Look at that. And guess what? It's look. It's, it's anonymous. It's and anonymous. It's anonymous. And, yeah. it, and then yeah. and then actually later on in this article, someone started arguing with this bloke saying you're talking nonsense. And someone later said, I don't know if I can find it. It said, oh, I think Mr. Singh is, is actually answering all these comments saying, um, you know, as an, why doesn't he actually use his real name? Anyway, so the point is, is that actually that was, that was in January, uh, that was January. And I think I've actually seen a huge change of attitude amongst lawyers, even in the last year, even since then. And in fact, there's a conference that I'm going to in three weeks time, uh, specifically for lawyers and accountants discussing blockchain and artificial intelligence. So I think that they are waking up, actually. You may not have seen it yet, but I can assure you they are, really are waking up. And actually, they now realize it's a it's a, an advantage. I mean, Leverton, have you guys come across Leverton, you two? You come across Leverton? Is that a yes? No? I have not, no. No, yes? No? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry. So what were you saying? Yeah. So I said I've heard, I've heard the name before, but I've never actually Okay. Had. Okay. So what these guys do is it, it's an artificial intelligence way of reading documents for lawyers. So rather than say hire, let's say you've got a big deal to do overnight and hiring 20 lawyers to read all these documents, the machines, it's machine learning, will actually summarize, you can scan your document in, it'll, it'll actually throw out a summary of the documents like that straight away. And that's where the world's going. It's of help to the lawyers, isn't it? It's not. It's not going to. Not going to do them out of jobs. Well. I mean, it, it's funny. My um, partner is in software, and my mum is an employment lawyer. And I remember four years ago them having a conversation, a disagreement, I would say, where he was saying machine learning and AI is going to transform the legal industry, and my mum was going, "No, you can't have a computer reading leases or reading legal documents." Um, be interesting to hear what they both have to say now. Has she seen it? You should show her. I will. Yeah, definitely. Leverton, show her. In fact, if she wants a demo, I can introduce her to Leverton because they've been on our show as well. And um, there's no commission. We're not getting commission. <laughs> We're not getting. It's 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 a pure. It's um. I just think it's all really interesting. Right. The last the last piece of news I would like. I'm interested in everyone's view on. I th I think I think we'll leave the deals to another time because there's if basically if anyone wants to buy a property. You know where to come. All right. We've got, we've got, we've got more property for sale than anyone else. So just singofyoursales.com, UK, Scotland. I've got, a, I've got one other thing I want to talk about. I'm interested in everyone's view. So last, so last week or so, eMove have had tremendous problems reported in the press. Are you aware of that, everyone? Everyone heard about that? eMove running out of money? Well, Purple Bricks' share price has come down significantly. I'm going to show everyone the graph. This is purple bricks. Can everyone? Right, there we go. Everyone got that? Mm -hmm. Gone from five pound a share to under two pound a share. So purple bricks, the darling of the online estate agency world. Now the question is, question is this: Has online estate agency got a future? Will people, or is it? Has the gloss come off? Has the has the prop tech? burst in terms of online estate agency now as two people who probably are on their phones a little bit more than say graham or doug or maybe me what would you think because you're you're very much in this world aren't you 
would you buy a building online? The answer, of course, is yes. And you would use click to purchase, and we all know that. But would you go finding a property online and use, would you use an online estate agency? I think it depends on what you're purchasing for. For me, it would be one of the biggest purchases I make because I've not bought a house yet and myself. I do not, I, I, don't, I would want somebody to guide me through that process. Um, so you can go and have a break and you can have the owner show you around and blah, blah, blah. But I, it's that expert knowledge, it's that expert guidance. I think it is any house you buy, whether you're, it's your first home, your second home, third home, they are always going to be the biggest investments most people will make. Now, the personal touch and that personal advice and guidance is never going to go away. The need and want for that is never, I don't see that ever leaving property industry because it is such a huge thing to do. And I wouldn't, I mean, I'm a property investor and developer, so I do trust myself, but I wouldn't trust myself to make that purchase without advice. Yeah, but you're assuming, therefore, they can't give you advice because they're an online estate agency. It's that personal one-to-one -one touch and that hand-holding and things like that. And I think, the I'm, I guess I'm assuming that those, I mean, I've not worked with them that much before, but I'm assuming that all of those step-by-step -step guides just doesn't happen unless I'm completely wrong. Rosanna? Sorry, Harry? I think it's interesting. So I was in a stage before I went to uni to become a surveyor, and um, I really saw before I worked in a residential estate agency, I didn't see the value that they brought. Brought. I would have the kind of millennial view that estate agents just took money for no reason, especially like letting agents. But from working in it, I saw all of the added value that the individuals working in a estate agency brought to a transaction. Um, so I, I think that personal touch, as Rosanna was saying, or that, that guidance um, from a person showing you around the building who is more neutral, you can be honest and transparent about your views with them. And I think that's appealing to people who don't have experience in buying property. But then on the other hand, I can see that um, everything in my world and my friend's world, a lot of it is online. So when you're looking for houses to buy, you're using right move and other online things and you what you send emails as opposed to ringing up the agents a lot of the time and so for some some people um not having uh, online will be pref the preferred method and i think it does have a future um as it's sort of easier to go on with you don't want to have agents calling you up all the time saying oh, this other this other property to come on the market if you if you're busy but my friend, she actually runs for and uh, works for a prop tech company called Homey. I don't know whether you've come across it before. And they're, uh, they're basically the middleman between the agents and the client. And they deal with a lot of international and overseas students. And essentially what they do is they get their criteria. And it's all on an app and it's all kind of online. They get the criteria and they get together a list of about five or six rental properties that, that, that fits these clients' criteria. And they do send them over to them along the way and things like that. And then they take them on a tour around all of these properties in one day and then they sit with them and they do all the leases and I maybe more personal personalized property searching like that in a more tech way maybe the future of it as opposed to loads of different agents and contacting loads of different agents where you have that one-stop shop that guides you through it but i think they'll always need that personal touch in some shape or form like I, I quite liked when I was buying my flat that I had an agent who I was speaking to who would call me up and say, this meets your criteria, or, or it, he made it sound like I was always at the forefront of his mind and he was always looking for stuff for me. And I think that that personal element of someone doing that for you is really nice. So why can't you do it online, though? Look what we're doing now. We're all having a chat. It's all online. What difference if you're standing, if I'm standing next to you or it's online? I have a slightly different view. I thought, I think that it's not about, personally, I think it's got nothing to do with whether it's online or offline. It's about quality of service. If your quality of service is not good enough, it doesn't matter how you go about anything, your clients will not come back to you. Your buyers will not come back to you. If an online estate agency can provide a high quality level of service, they will get the business. The problem, I think, is that their price point is too low. And what they've done is they've created a drive 
down in the general industry. And I thought that high street estate agencies would all close. I now don't. I don't think they will now. I think it's uh, my view has completely changed. I just think so far the online agencies haven't delivered the quality of service that they were suggesting. People don't want to show people around their house. And I think that that's where it's gone. There's, an, there's, a, there's something interesting where, which has been suggested by um, some leading academics that in not, the not too distant future, your ability to understand and know who owns all the properties in a street which you want to buy, you'll be able to find on your phone, you'll be able to find on a computer. That data will be available. So you'll be able, and there'll be instant online valuation tools. And if you are interested in buying a property, it may not even be on the market, but what will happen is you'll be able to approach through some interface, the owners along the street and say, I'm interested in your house. Would you talk to me about selling it? And that will rule out the actual need for the intermediary. And I think that the role of the agent, okay. there still will be agents, but their role will change and they will become advisory rather than brokerage type. And I believe that's happening in the commercial market very much so. And I think it's going to filter into the residential market. Just a personal view. Washington. Sounds a bit of a nightmare for anyone who's got properties with development potential, though. Everyone's going to be approaching them all of the time. Well, yeah, no, I think what will happen, I think what will happen is that you're, you're it's a bit like, um, you'll be able to allow access or not. You're, it's a bit like if we have a thing on our website, which means that if you want to have a video chat with us, you can press a button and you can start talking to us. But we see who you are and we either let you in or we don't let you in. And it's just, I think it's the same sort of, sort of thing's going to happen, you see. So, you know, half, you've got to remember that half the time that um, people put their house on the market, they don't really, they're looking for free valuations. That's what I think it's like a 35% fall through rate. So how can you run a business like that? Anyway, that's my view. That's my view. Right. Two o'clock. Who wants to rush out and buy something? Right. I think any other business? You don't, you don't have to rush out. You just do it online. That's the point. Right. That's true. That is true. If you want to sit in a queue. Oh, oh, oh. What was that me? Oh. Okay. Any other business? Anyone? Remember... Rosanna and Harry, for anyone who is under what? Under 30? Under 35? Under 40? Just, just starting out. Oh. It's uh, anyone free to come along. It's just whether you feel like you, you need the support. Okay. So anybody who wants to get introduced to Harry or Rosanna at Creation, you'll find them online. It's CRE hyphen, isn't it? Creation with a hyphen after E. Um, or come to us and we'll introduce you. It's a it's a great group. I really recommend anyone new into the industry um, attending the event and making contacts. So that's it then. If there's no other business other than rush out shopping and buy your problems from Singavir, I think we're done. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Okay. So okay. So Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Great. Great. Harry, Bye. thank you very much for your, thank you for coming on. Rosanna, thank you very much. Now remember, we're going to put it on our podcast. So any of your groups, any of your network will be able to listen to you on their way home tonight. We'll, or they could watch online. On so we'll send that through shortly. So everyone, thank you very much okay. for watching. Thanks, oh, well, we've got a guest. Who's that guest? Okay. Oh, well. Okay, go. <laughs> okay. Thanks, bye. bye.